would you please stand in our prayer of illumination and remain standing as the scripture is read. Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture passage today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, verses 13 through 14. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide, and the road is easy that leads to destruction, and there are many who take it. For the gate is narrow, and the road is hard that leads to life, and there are few who find it. Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Today we are continuing in our study of the Sermon on the Mount, which we began, uh, I think, a couple of months ago now. And um, today we are moving into chapter 7 a little more deeply than we did last week. Uh, as I have shared before, these sermons are drawing heavily from the sermons on the Sermon on the Mount that John Wesley had written and preached. Uh, John Wesley was the founder of Methodism, and when he wrote these sermons, he gave them to the, the Methodist preachers and um, asked them to preach these sermons. They also are considered to be part of our doctrine. And so to understand what we as Methodists believe, this is a pri these sermons are a primary source of what we believe. And so uh, it's been a real joy to, uh, to preach these. Let's go to God. God, we thank you for your Holy Spirit, for your presence with us, your presence which is inside of us and around us and is always moving and causing us to uh, become aware more deeply of, your, of you and the truth of who we are and who you want for us to be. God, we thank you for your word. We believe, God, that our life's project is to live under the authority of your word, that our job is to know your word and to obey it. God, we, we recognize as we study your word that that is challenging. It's difficult. And for us to be people who, who really live into your word, we, we need your Holy Spirit to help us, to help us to understand and help us to apply it to our lives. And so we pray, Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name, amen. Most of us, if given a choice between something which is easy and something which is hard, we'll take the easy thing. You know, we like things to be easier, and we seek out uh, life circumstances which are easier, not harder. When we go to shop, we look for the space that's closest to the store, not furthest, because it makes it easier on us to not have to walk so far, especially in the summertime when it's hot. Um, when, we, when we are doing yard work or we are going about our jobs, we naturally move toward things which are easier, not harder. And, um, but, and, and so we just kind of go through life doing what is easier. And, there's, and that makes a lot of sense in a lot of ways. But there is something important for us to see, which is that sometimes what is easier is not necessarily better. And sometimes what is harder is much better. Years ago, I was with a group of friends and we were backpacking in Montana, and we had been backpacking for a week. And we, we were on the second to last day of our, our backpacking trip. We knew that the next day, we would be uh, hiking a short distance out to the trailhead and, and we would be through. And so this day before we did that, we, were, um, we had a long ways to go. And we were about halfway through our day, and we, we recognized on the topographic map that the trail went um, this direction, and it went up to the top of a ridge, and then it came back down the other side of the ridge, but at right where we were. And that if we were to just pop over the ridge this way, we would be right where we wanted to camp. And so we looked at the ridge, and we looked at the topographic map, and it looked like there was this, this kind of keyhole that we could, we could go through. And so we discussed it and we decided, okay, do we go over the, 
the ridge this way or do we, we hike it out and then hike it back? One way looked easy, the other way looked hard. Guess which way we went? And so we decided to go over the ridge. To do that it meant that we had to go off trail. And, um, and so as we, were, we, we went off trail, we started up, and uh, the further we got, the steeper it became. And I remember finding myself um, holding myself to the rock face, um, climbing up with this 30-pound pack, and wondering why we decided to do this. Uh, it, it was one of these moments where what looked to be easy ended up not being the better way. Jesus talks about our life in God, and he says in this part of the Sermon on the Mount, in, in verse 13, he says, enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the road is easy that leads to destruction. And there are many who take it. There is a way to go through life with God where if we take what seems to be easier, we actually end up moving in the direction of a worse life. The, the gate, he says, to that way is a wide gate. It's not hard to get through. And a lot of people take, go that way. He says many are those who take it. That gate, Wesley says, is sin. And that sin leads us on this easy path. Sin uh, tempts us to go in a particular direction. And most people follow the desires of the flesh, not what God would want them to. And most people are going to go the easy route. And so whatever feels good is what people are going to do. And so often what our society deems as okay is actually in opposition to what God says is okay. But there is this tendency in us to want to do the easy thing. And so many of us find ourselves moving in the direction toward destruction. Jesus says, this is the easy way, but it is the way that leads to destruction. Um, if you go to Israel, there is this, uh, there's this area in Israel that's called the Shephelah. And the region of the Shephelah is this, this area between the, the ridge line of the hill country and the Mediterranean coast. And if you're standing in the Shephelah and you look to the west, you see it's wide, it's flat, it gets easier and easier as you move in that direction. But if you turn to the east, you see the road getting steeper and steeper and also more and more narrow. And so uh, Jack Beck uh, suggests that that topography may have been in the back of Jesus' mind when he spoke about this. And what we know about Jesus' day is that they were very much drenched in the scriptures. And so their historic memory of that region would have told them that the, would have made sense in a very different way than it might for us because to be in the Shephelah and, and to look to the west, you would be looking the easier direction, the easier way to travel, but you would also be looking in the direction of the Philistines in their historic memory who were their greatest enemies. And so to, to go the easy, wide way was to move in the direction of destruction, to move in the direction of the Philistines who were your enemies. Whereas to look to the east and to look to, to the road that gets more and more narrow but is also more difficult to travel, you would be looking in the direction of the temple. So one direction is towards destruction, the other direction is towards salvation. And what Jesus knows about us is that because of our tendency, we move towards things that will ultimately destroy us instead of moving towards the things that give us life. And so he implores us in this passage, enter through the narrow gate. Don't move in the direction of sin, but move in the direction that leads to life. Don't go through the wide gate, but go through the narrow gate. And while the wide gate is, is sin, the narrow gate is like a filter. And it filters out all that is unholy, all that is wicked, all that is opposed to the will of God. Jesus is saying, move through that filter. Because God's goal for us is not to be like the rest of the world, but to be like him. 
His goal for us is not that we would move into greater and greater versions of sin, but that we would have less and less sin in our lives. And we might think that, you know, when, when, when we are in the body of believers and we are in church, that there is somehow less sin. But I know that not to be true because I know myself. And what I know about myself is that probably from the time I woke up to the time I got here, I probably sinned a hundred times in different ways that I don't even know about. And my guess is that you did too because we have such a predilection towards sin. We have such a predilection toward it. And sin is, is really defined as being insubordinate to the will of God. It's about being disobedient to the, to the will of God in our lives. And so while God is is filled with love and wants us to be loving, we have a tendency to rebel against that quite often. But what God's goal for us looks like in Scripture is to be like Him and not to look like sin. And so He says to us in Leviticus chapter 19, He says, it says here in verse 1, The Lord spoke to Moses saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy for I the Lord your God am holy. You shall be holy. This isn't an empty sort of command that we can dismiss. It is God's desire that we would be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy. We, God wants for us to look different from the rest of the world. God wants us not to be going along with the world and doing what is so easy and what feels good. God wants us to be holy as our Heavenly Father is holy, and that means doing what is hard but it also means doing what is better. Uh, Jesus echoes this in the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. You might remember that back in chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount in verse 48, Jesus says, Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. This is a variation off of, off of that, but they, they kind of mean the same thing. To be holy is to be perfect. To be perfect is to be holy. And that's a, that, that idea of being perfect as our Heavenly Father is perfect is probably, uh, it, it, it sounds a little weird to our ears because we have a concept of what perfection is that is, is, um, is not exactly what Jesus has in mind. I don't know about you, but for me, when I hear perfection, and I, the images that come to my mind as soon as I hear perfection are things like having really, really straight white teeth. It's like having uh, no hairs out of place. It's like never, never wearing uh, uh, black socks with the wrong colored shoes. You know, it's things like having a lawn that's perfectly manicured. It's like having the, get, being the, the recipient of the Yard of the Month Award. I've never gotten that. Um, it's, it's things like having a 4.0 GPA. It's things like having not just a good job, but having the best job. It's things like getting uh, first place, not second place. It's, uh, when I think of perfection, I'm thinking about accomplishments. I'm thinking about accolades. I'm thinking about these kinds of things. I'm thinking about things that when people see perfection, they're jealous. But that's not what Jesus has in mind because that version of perfection is how the world would define perfection. The Bible de defines perfection very differently. The word that Jesus uses in Matthew uh, chapter 5, verse 40, 48, the Greek word behind perfect here is teleos. Be teleos as your heavenly Father is teleos. And teleos is not about performative perfection. It's not about um, looking perfect to the world. Perfection in the, in the understanding of teleos is to have a heart that's so full of love for God and for neighbor that you can't stop loving people through action. It's about completion. It's about maturity. It's about to, to be perfect in the sense that Jesus is referring to here is to be perfect in love. It's to be perfectly mature. It's to be totally complete. Jesus was perfect in love. Jesus never did anything out of selfish ambition. Jesus was motivated by love in everything he did. He reflected the heart of the Father because the heart of the Father is love. The heart of the Father is mercy and grace and justice and all good things. The heart of the Father 
is perfect in love. His heart is so filled with love that when he looked at us and he saw that we were stuck in our sin, he was not satisfied to let us continue to suffer. He himself came in the flesh and he suffered himself on our behalf so that we could be forgiven of our sins. That's how much God loves us. And those of us who have said yes to Jesus and we've received him into our hearts as our Lord and our Savior, in that moment that we have received him, guess what happens to the sin? It is wiped away. And in that moment, we receive salvation. What a beautiful thing it is that the, our Heavenly Father is perfect. What a beautiful thing it is that our Heavenly Father is holy because it means that he, His love is so wonderful that we are ushered into His presence and we are made right with Him so that we can commune with Him. And we believe that when we receive Jesus, we are saved. We are saved from all that that wide road would lead us toward. But if you're like me, you recognize that, that your life is often lived on that wide road instead of that narrow road. So what's going on here? How do we, how do we put this all together? We're saved, but then what does that mean for us? What does that mean for our lives? What does that mean for people who have such a predilection towards the wide road? What happens then? What does that mean? It's, it's fascinating to hear what Paul says. It's inspiring to hear what he says in Romans chapter 6. It says, what then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means, he says. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? We should never think to ourselves, I'm saved, therefore I'm, I don't have to worry about the sin in my life. If, we have been, uh, if, we, if our sins have been re forgiven, if we have died to sin, why in the world would we go on living in it? And so we hear Jesus' call, enter through the narrow gate. Enter through the narrow gate, not the wide gate. I want to offer to you an acronym, and I think that this acronym helps us to enter through the narrow gate. And for those of you who are here for the first time, I, I don't normally do acronyms, but the Holy Spirit put it on my heart to do this acronym, so as I'm trying to live under the power of the Holy Spirit, here we go. So the acronym is A-C-T-S, ACTS, A-C-T-S. And the A, the A for us to, to go through the narrow gate is acknowledge. It's, it's acknowledgement. And, and so um, the first step is to acknowledge the sin in our lives. It's to acknowledge where we have, have taken the easy route rather than uh, have gone through the narrow gate. It's, a, it's to acknowledge. And so on a daily basis, we need to do a self-examination of the prior 24 hours and think through the ways in which we moved in the direction of Philistia instead of toward the temple. And so we think through things and we can ask ourselves questions. And if you're looking for 22 great questions, there's this beautiful list of 22 questions that I keep talking, I've talked about them like six times in 2024. I love them. But they ask, the, the, the questions are so good, but they get us to think about our lives in ways that we might not otherwise uh, consider. Because most of us don't like to, con like to admit that we're wrong. And so these questions of self-examination help us to acknowledge the sin in our lives. And so we ask things like, was there ever a moment yesterday when I did something about which my conscience was uneasy? Or we ask questions like, uh, was, did I speak about my faith to somebody else yesterday? And we, we ask ourselves things like, did I present myself as being better than I really am? Was I honest? Was I truthful? Was I trustworthy? So acknowledging the sin in our life is the first step toward that narrow gate. The, so that's A. C is confess. So we acknowledge the sin in our life. Now it's time to confess it. And we certainly want to go to God in prayer and confess it to God in prayer. And we, this is something we, we need to do on a daily basis. But sometimes we actually need to confess it to people. Sometimes we need to go up to somebody and say, you know when I said that yesterday? 
I wasn't telling you the truth. When you asked me about how you looked in those jeans, you know, you, um, I was just seeing if you were paying attention. Don't do it. Plead the fifth. Um, but uh, confessing to another person when you have, have thought something wrongly of them, when you've spoken behind their back, when you've done something, uh, is, uh, is, is so important. And so acknowledge the sin, confess the sin. The T is turn. Turn from the sin. Turn from the sin in your life. When you start seeing patterns of sin in your life, turn from that pattern. When you find yourself going down the wide, easy road to destruction, turn from it. Turn towards salvation. Turn towards life. The, the, the word repent simply just means turn. And so having acknowledged it and confessed it, we turn. That's the T. S is strive. In fact, when, when Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 7, uh, over in Luke, where Jesus says the same thing, instead of saying, enter through the narrow gate, in Luke it says, strive to enter through the narrow gate strive. And so we acknowledge the sin in our life, we confess it, we turn from it, and now we strive to move in the direction of God. We strive to move through the narrow gate. We strive to do better. And so one day we wake up, we confess all these things, we turn from it, and we strive, and we fail. Guess what we do the next day? We acknowledge, confess, turn, and we strive again. And the next day we strive again, and we keep striving. And, and as we strive, we're doing certain very specific things. Uh, we are submitting ourselves to the authority of Scripture as we strive. We are entering into prayer as we strive. We are seeking Christian community as we strive. We're filling our heads and our eyes with things that are good for us and healthy for us, not things that would tempt us away from the things of God. The striving is about a lifestyle of moving in the direction of, of life. There's going to come a day for every single one of us. There's going to come a day when we will give an account of our life, when we will stand before God and he will say, let's, let's rewind the tape and see what happened. And when we do that, we, we may have received salvation in Jesus, but how is that conversation going to go? We don't earn our salvation, and so this is not about earning it, but we, we will be asked to give an account of our life. And as we look back over our life and we see what's happened, what, we're, what God is going to be asking and wondering about is, did you go through the narrow gate, or did you at least strive to go through the narrow gate, or did you just go with the crowd and do what was easy? The easy way is not as good as the narrow way. And so we will have this moment where we give this account. Uh, John Wesley believed that when we die, we will receive entire sanctification, meaning that we will be made perfect for eternity. We will, all of that perfection that we've, we sought after in our lives, it will be given to us. And a lot of Christians live their lives as if, well, then I don't need to try because then when I die, I'll get it. But we as, as Methodists, what we believe is that don't, we, we should not wait until we take our first breath in eternity to do this. We can begin to be made perfect now. We can begin to move in the direction of sanctification and entire sanctification. We can move in the direction of perfect, and we actually can be made perfect in this life by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so wouldn't it be wonderful if we strove to enter through the narrow gate and we stood before God on Judgment Day and when he rewound the tape, we could see all of these different moments when we moved in the direction of perfect love, when we became more and more holy, when we became more and more like Jesus. It would be so much better to do that. And so the invitation for us today Given the choice between the easy, wide road and the narrow, difficult road, given the choice between destruction and salvation, between death and life, 
is to choose life. Choose life. Amen.